this lecture, by the way, the, the book, I tell my class, the book gives you a lot more information. You know, it's a lot more depth. We're flying at 10,000 feet to kind of figure out the highlights. So, you're, you know, bear with me. If some of this stuff doesn't make sense, you may need to go back. What I tell my students is take my, my slides and go back and look at what the book says about that. You need to sort of get this. this What happens when a virus infects a cell? Well, replication cycling usually results in the death and lysis of the cell. What do I mean, lysis? Breaking down. Lysis, lytic, destruction of, breaking of. Indeed, the lytic replication cycle, there's two cycles you're going to need to know. I'm sure you're going to have to know this for your, your test. There's Two cycles. One of them is the lytic cycle. Okay? Lytic cycle is when there's attachment, entry, synthesis, meaning making viral particles in the cell, assembly, and release, and the cell is destroyed. Okay? It's lysed. That's it, that word Let me give you an example. Here is our neuronal. It is landing on a particular cell. In this case, it's a bacterium. It knows, because of these very specific receptors, exactly where it's going to land. When it lands, this base plate here has some enzymes that actually eat a hole, if you will, dissolve. This outer membrane protein here, and it allows this sheath to basically penetrate through into the bacterial cell. This thing then injects its DNA, DNA into the host cell, and here's the schematic of the whole thing. What is finding something interesting about this? No, nothing interesting. Here it is. Lands there. By the way, this is the bacterial chromosome. It lands there. It injects. This DNA here is coded for enzymes that cleave. They're called restriction enzymes. You don't need to worry about that, but they cut, if you will. They cut up the host uh, DNA. They, this viral Phage DNA encodes for viral particles. They make all the little virus pieces, they assemble them, and they release through the lysis or rupture of this bacterial cell. It's dead. Okay? For all intents and purposes, that cell died there, like the night of the living dead. Uh, they're dead, but they're still alive. Uh, you know, no, they're not alive. They're dead. And there's a virus inside it that is replicating like crazy using the cell machinery that still exists, but that cell is dead. Okay? And it just takes a period of time for it to place, release, and then the whole thing starts over again. This is the lytic. A little bit more about that, and it just gives you a little bit more. If you have the base, the tail, the sheath, the DNA, the capsid, the head, the fibers, etc., it just shows some of the complexity here. There are over 70 different proteins that have to be made to make this bacteria phage. So, I mean, you know, it's not a trivial thing. So it gets in and it makes these phage particles, it assembles them, and then it places or ruptures itself. Same thing. Okay. If we look at this, we say, okay, we have a we take some bacteria phage, and we take the bacteria phage and we put it into something that cells are just going to allow it to grow. We can't see anything happening. 
because in this space in here, this is here, where it's the bacteriophage has gone in and it's doing its work. It's no longer outside the cell, it's inside the cell. But we don't see anything going on. Here it's breaking down. Here it's building its own pieces. It's replicating. And so for this period of time, we don't see anything at all that's happening. When this happens, that's what happens here. Boom. All that's sudden, the license. That's where it lices. Yeah. We go from nothing to flow. And this is called burst. the burst size. Yeah. And we can actually titrate how many viruses, you know, the, the burst size, how, how long it takes for the birth burst time to occur. And with uh, basically the T and bacteria of E. coli, it's about 25 minutes. For a whole generation of these organisms to be replicated and released. Okay? And this is just you know, a scale. If you had you could have a hundred times as much after this burst. Here's something, this is the other one, and then you're, you'll get confused because the wording is very similar. I said this was the lytic cycle. This is called the lysogenic cycle. And I know they sound very similar, but they are completely different. The lytic cycle, we just went through. Ruptures. What happens if this bacteriophage puts its DNA into a cell and it doesn't break down the cell? It doesn't disrupt everything, make its own virus and everything. You see what can happen here? This becomes incorporated into the host cell's DNA, and it lays dormant. You say, oh, that's terrible. And you have herpes infection, cold sore. Anybody ever cold sore? Anybody ever get a cold sore? You got it, finally, an honest man. Yeah, he gets cold sore. My wife gets cold sore. Uh, my wife is an RN, she's a nurse practitioner, she gets a cold sore. When does she get a cold sore? She usually gets a cold sore when she, before we lived in Florida, if she came down here and got a lot of sun, she'd get a cold sore, and then she'd get this. <laughs> um, stress, if you're pregnant, and if you've had children, so you probably had children, Maybe you would get a cold sore when you had children because of the stress of pregnancy. What is a cold sore? It's a herpes virus. That's herpes type 1. Yeah, there's a herpes type 2. It's actually another lecture. But herpes type 1 cold sore viruses, that's exactly what they do. They incorporate into your and my DNA and they lay there a cult. Nothing's happening until they are induced. Give me another human viral infection that has the same kind of thing. Chicken pox. Big up. Chicken pox. What do you get if you are. Yeah. Shingles. Yeah. You get shingles. I don't know about that yet. <laughs> okay. You get, get shingles. You see it. Yeah, shingles. Shingles are chicken pox viruses that are in the neurons, the neural tissues of our bodies, and uh, they lay dormant. Very, very similar to this. <coughs> so, does it happen? Oh yeah, it happens. It happens with us. We get these viral particles. Now, we're going to hear later on in this lecture, um, viruses can cause cancer. You know why they can cause cancer? Because they can get into your genetic makeup. That's why. And for Kitz lymphoma, there are several cancers that are definitely linked to viruses. So this isn't really abstract here. This is honestly going on all the time. This is the lysogenic cycle, lysogeny or lysogenic cycle, where this piece of DNA gets incorporated. Now, what do you call that virus when it's incorporated? 
Well, all you can find it as is just a piece of DNA that happens to be viral, but we call it a prophage. Okay? Prophage. Now, prophage, obviously, we're referring back in this case to a bacteriophage. And I just thought of a question I can't answer myself. Would, if this was not a bacteriophage, but it's like a herpes virus in us, would we call it a provirus? And I guess, yeah, we would we'd call it a provirus. So provirus or pro prophage is when you have a piece of viral nucleic acid in your cells. But it's not doing anything until it's induced. Now we use the word induced mainly for what? Labor. Induced. You know, induced labor. Same thing. Inducing labor is simply starting labor early. Okay? You can use pitocin, oxytocin, whatever, breaker of water, a variety of different things. Something is going to induce this baby to come out of this prophage or proviral state. Usually, usually it's stress, some form of stress. Immunosuppressants, radiation, uh, emotional distress, um, lots of different things can induce these viruses from coming out. Pregnancy, pregnancy. You're going into uh, you know, that aspect of medicine, obstetrics. Maybe some of your pregnant women will have cold sores, et cetera, et cetera, things, because basically it's stress of pregnancy. By the way, pregnancy is also immunosuppressant. Consider that a woman is immunosuppressed when she's pregnant. Okay. Lytic cycle, lysogenic cycle. Do you understand? Is it clear? Clear. So then it goes to the lytic cycle after this? Yes. That's right. Now it can go through many generations here. Many generations. It can go through years. Okay? If it comes out, it's going to go into this cycle. Now, if it goes into this cycle, what's going to happen to the cell that it was in? It's going to kill. That's right. It's going to like it's going to lice it, it's going to rupture, it's going to damage it. If you get shingles, if you get herpes, that's an expression of those cells that were infected being destroyed. Is that like when they say you can have like HIV for many years and be asymptomatic before it progresses? Is that that asymptomatic phase? Not really. And I, I, I say that qualified not really that I don't really know what I'm talking about. But, uh, I don't think so. I don't think it goes into this dormant stage. I think that it just takes a period of time and I'm not really sure why it doesn't Ramp go time faster. Yeah, right. And I don't know. That's a very good question. And that's one that I would ask, can the HIV go into this? To my knowledge, it doesn't do that. It's just a very slow moving infection. It's knocking off these CD4 cells, et cetera, et cetera. And at some point, it reaches a point where you become immunosuppressed. So you have the lytic cycle. Just goes around, lice, 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 invade, lice, invade, lice, invade, lice. Lysogenic cycle sounds very similar, but it's very, very different. Lysogenic, oh, becomes incorporated, doesn't rupture the cell, doesn't kill the cell. This prophage or pro viral uh, DNA replicates with the genome. So it replicates. So it's still there. There's still chunk there, and something induces it to go over to the other side. Okay. I'll let you read that. Animal virus is attached by random equation. Just bump into people. spikes on the other and other attachment molecules and they mediate attachment by three different member uh, three different mechanisms direct penetration membrane fusion and phagocytosis let's just take a look at some of these direct penetration these are the receptors these are the red things 
they have complementary receptors on the virus part, whatever it happens to be. This guy here then uh, can directly penetrate because the receptor attaches it. This uh, it's on the edge of the outer the protein. The virus basically uses enzymes to make whole, if you will, and it just penetrates and the viral genome is virus, the cat stays on the outside, the genome and goes in, the genetic material. That's direct penetration. Membrane fusion. Here again, we've got this lipid bilayer, lipid bilayer here, receptors that are complementary, it attaches, and we have fusion, because these membranes are very, very similar, if not identical, they fuse. And it actually causes the virus to you know, on the terminals. And then third is, uh, is there a third? receptors are matching this virus. There is an invagination, if you will, surrounding that virus. It engulfs it, brings it in, and then the virus is released once it's inside. Pretty amazing. See, it's pretty simple. It's pretty, um, it seems simple, but it's not simple. It's anything but simple. There are PhDs to be gotten in almost any of these steps, you know, virus replication, how things get in, and how does this happen? How does this virus know to do this? How does this all happen? It's pretty sophisticated stuff. Most DNA viruses assemble in the nucleus, the uh, DNA nucleus, okay? Most RNA viruses are in the cytoplasm. What's in the cytoplasm that has RNA? Ribosomes. Yeah. So it makes sense. If you're an RNA virus, you're going to develop in the ribosomes, probably out there in the cytoplasm. If you're a DNA virus, you're going to be in the DNA material, which is you know, the nuclear region in bacteria or the nucleus in a eukaryotic cell. Envelope viruses cause persistent infection with slow shed of the virus particles. You can have some that are consistently <coughs> shedding new viral particles. For you as a uh, potential medical practitioner, I mean, some of your patients may be infected longer than others, depending on what they're infected with, okay? because of this not necessarily persistence, which you do have in some, but because of the length of time that you're actually shedding the virus. And you need to know about that. Virus infection contact. Release of envelope viruses. Again, I apologize we go so fast, but you guys have got a short period of time. Uh, here's the viral capsid. Remember, I said these little guys that are responsible for attachment, they show up on the outer membrane protein before this guy buds through. We can see this, because we can see a patch of these coming up, if you will. The virus then buds through. It enrobes itself in this material. And so this and this are indistinguishable. And that helps when you have fusion of these two later on. So this guy is floating away with its own specific receptors that are, by the way, specific for this cell. And when it, this binds to another cell's receptors, receptors, there's fusion of that membrane, fusion. Because the membrane is like that. Latency. Animal viruses remain dormant or latent in the host cells. And the virus could say that. Condition is permanent when you have a lysogenic cycle. The DNA will say, 
incorporates into the host cell, that's going to be permanent. In other words, it's not going to come out and the cell is going to get healthy again. Now, that cell is going to die or it's going to uh, pass on that trait to the next daughter cell. So this provirus is a permanent condition. When it is induced, it goes to the lytic cycle, okay, then it kills the cell. Um, yeah. Your book talks about viruses and cancer. And indeed, there are a lot of known cancers that are caused by viruses. Some of you just named some. HPV, human papillomavirus. What's the virus associated with that? What is the cancer that's associated with cervical. HPV? Cervical. cervical cancer. Yeah. If a female is positive for the human papillomavirus, she has an increased risk for cervical cancer. Why? Because we know these viruses can incorporate into those cells. We know those cells that have HPV virus in them are more susceptible to going neoplastic, okay, which means cancer. What are they doing now to try and hold down uh, cervical infections with HPV virus? Vaccinations. Shots, vaccinations, that's right. Who gets the shots? Young females. Young females? Yeah, 12 or 13, who else? Just recently, last two years. Young males. Guess where the girls get it from? Males. Well, if you can get those males so they're not carrying it, you can stop the infection before she gets it. And so that's Gardasil. There are several things. And they were first marketed for females. And then people started to say, well, wait a minute. If it's good for her, why not? And he doesn't get cervical cancer, but he's the carrier. Could we prevent him from infecting? And the answer is yes. And they have, in the last two years, licensed these vaccinations now for young men as well, young boys. Uh, okay, let's take a look at this oncogene theory. This is a theory. A theory simply explains something that we don't know for sure if this is the way it works, but it seems to work this way. The oncogene theory says that, it says a variety of different things. One of the things is that Cancer can be caused by genetic material, oncogenes. Oncogenes can be either carried by or stimulated by viruses. Okay, And the oncogene theory says <coughs> there's multiple hits needed to induce cancer. Let's think about this for a minute. Here is a proto-oncogene. This is something that is going to cause cancer. It's a gene. This is a repressor for this. It turns it off. If we get a hit, okay, and we're going to say that a virus infects, it hits this thing, and this proto-oncogene, if you will, switches on. Click this oncogene, which now is coding for cancer. It turns it on. Okay. There's a repressor gene downstream from this though. And what this repressor does is that it switches this off. Okay. So you've got a virus that switched on the cancer. You've got another downstream little bit of genetic material that switches it off. Perfect. What happens then? You get a hit, turns on the oncogene. You get a second hit in this area that inactivates this repressor. And there's no switch to turn it off anymore. And the result is cancer. Indeed, they've done several studies with several different kinds of cancers and cancer models, particularly cancers caused by viruses. And they found that this does happen. It takes multiple hits, more than a single hit. And a hit is, in, in 
insertion and mutation into the genetic material by a virus. So cancer is not easily induced in us, but it can be. It certainly can be. What activates oncogenes? You <coughs> delight. Sit out on the beach too long and you get anything from melanoma to basal cell to squamous cell to a bunch of different things. What are you doing? You are turning on these oncogenes. How about radiation? Ionizing the radiation? Some non-ionizing radiation. Uh, carcinogens, chemicals that can cause mutations to our DNA. Okay, benzene things like that, viruses. I just want you to see that we know there's a whole classification of things that can change genetically our cells. What's a cancer cell? It's a cell that has lost its identity in the body. It becomes autonomous of the body. Now, all our cells have a role to do. But if, say, a prostate cell or a breast cell becomes proliferative, which means that it starts to proliferate independent of the body, then we have a problem. You can have cells of the immune system, lymphocytes, which are white blood cells. You get a lymphoma. Okay? You can have skin cells that are pigmented, called melanocytes, that can go nuts cause up melanoma. What does that mean? It simply means that these cells somehow have gen genetically been altered so they don't stop replicating. They're switched on and they replicate until they basically be killed. Because they get out of the primary site, they metastasize, and they go to your brain, your lungs, your kidney, liver, whatever, and they they kill you. Activations of oncogenes genes then, the genes in our own systems that can cause cancer, all these things. Fifteen percent of cancers are virally close. Some cancers carry copies of oncogenes. genes. They have the switch, in other words, that turns on the cancer. They carry it. Some stimulate oncogenes that are already there. So maybe they come in with an oncogene or they stimulate one that's there. Some interfere with tumor repression when they insert in the host genome, and that's a whole other thing. Virally cancer cause cancers for kids lymphoma, Epstein Barr virus. Capacies sarcoma, herpes simplex. Capacies very common with HIV infection. Very, very thick. They called it back in the 80s gay cancer. If a man had AIDS, he probably was going to develop Kaposi's sarcoma. And that was one of the first things that pointed to AIDS being a viral disease. They said, well, he smokes. All these gay men are got, got the same kind of cancer. Why is that? Because this herpes simplex is causing this cancer, and it's an honor to Cervical cancer, the human papilloma virus we talked about. We have a lot. Uh, nine? Nine, uh, ten. Okay, ten. Well, if you have to leave, leave. Um, you can stay, give me five minutes, and I'll get through this thing. We can culture in whole organisms, we can culture in tissues of whole organisms. We can take out, for instance, a liver, mince it up, and isolate and identify viruses and liver. That's what cell and tissue culture is called. A plaque, this is a lot of bacteria. What we've done is we've spread bacterial cells all over this plate with a spreader and let them grow up. At the same time we spread the bacterial cells though, we added bacterial five. We're going to keep those bacteria pillow. Every time you see a hole, that's an area where the bacteria have been killed. That's called, and this is a test question in my class, a plaque, P-L-A-Q-U-E, okay? These are viral plaques.
cracks. They're holes in a mono layer of cells caused by the destruction of the cells in that particular area. So that's a plaque. And if you said, how can we titer, or how can we count how many viral particles there is in a particular amount, we can do an assay like this and then count. We can count these number of plaques, say, in a quarter of this, and multiply by a factor that's appropriate, and we can say we've got this many viral particles per ml. Okay, we can culture them in chicken eggs, which we do, simply because it's sterile, it's cheap, and it's easy, and it's living cells. We can make cell cultures where we can take tissues, skin, organs, etc. We can essentially treat those with enzymes that break the, the cells that are in our tissues into individual cells. We throw viruses in them. Ah, oh, yeah, three ounces. Oh, you got to read this. <laughs> read my notes, even because here's a weird thing. Prions are not viruses. They're not living. They are proteins that cause brain tissues to unravel. Okay? You remember mad cow disease? You've probably heard that. That's what a prion causes, is mad cow disease. Basically, you'll have to read this. We don't have time to go through it. I apologize. This is the normal way the proteins in the brain are with prion, which is sort of a protein that catalyzes the unfolding, unrolling, if you will, of these proteins. When they're in this form, they don't work. And your brain turns to open. Um, not really, but I mean, uh, when prions are present, they cause a newly synthesized cellular PRP protein to refold into prion PRP, which simply means that the proteins in prions catalyzes or causes the brain tissue to not work and to die. What do we get? We get fatal neurological degeneration. We get spongiform encephalopathies. You say, well, what does that mean? Well, it's like a sponge. You know how a sponge has big holes in it? Well, that's what a spongiform encephalopathy. Bovine spongiform encephalopathy. Crutzfield Jakob disease in human beings. Kuru, scraping in sheep. Kuru in. Kuru in what? I don't know. Oh, yeah. Kuru in something. These are all diseases of the brain caused by these prions. Here's what it looks like. And there's some potential. Sorry for the fast tour. I hope that it's been useful. Um, if you want to ask questions or stay around, I'll be here. Um, you mentioned making a vaccine for malaria. Yes. Against various stages of the infection. Okay. Malaria.